Oh, I really don't need applause. <laughs> You can, you can see how I perform at the end. Uh, so we have three speakers on this really interesting panel. We're going to take a little detour, although criminal justice has obviously infused uh, a lot of the conversation thus far. Um, our first speaker is Rebecca Wexler, and it seems in keeping with the conference. I'm not going to give a formal introduction, but we've loosely ordered things to go through the process. So kind of starting at the front end of the criminal justice process with decisions about bail and so forth, moving um, in our next speaker to some proof issues uh, and how we how we um, you know, think about guilt and innocence with algorithmic evidence, and then at the back end, sentencing and so forth. So that's a very loose structure, and we'll start with our first speaker. Thank you. So the criminal justice system is becoming automated. At every stage, from investigations and policing, to bail, to forensic evidence, to sentencing, to parole, computer systems are increasingly guiding outcomes. The developers of these systems are often private companies who claim that details about how the systems work are trade secrets. And as a result, oh, I should speak into this. All right, how's that? As a result, they often refuse to disclose the information to criminal defendants or their attorneys, even when served with a subpoena, even if the disclosure would be protected by a protective order or would be under seal. You heard some of the details, I believe, about these issues um, from Natalie Ram yesterday, and we'll hear more from my co-panelists on details of cases and uh, facts and specific examples. So I'm actually going to focus a bit more on laying the theoretical groundwork of the relationship between trade secret law and criminal concerns. And I'm going to argue that criminal courts are taking a completely wrong approach to dealing with these trade secret claims. Then at the end, I will, as Aaron said, talk a little bit about how the issues appear in bail hearings and pass on the baton. So today, the common view among legislatures and courts alike is that trade secrets should be protected in cases with some form of evidentiary privilege, at least in civil proceedings. Two-thirds of the states have codified an evidentiary privilege for trade secrets. Courts in most other jurisdictions recognize a common law variation of it. And there's a growing trend among criminal trial courts to extend that privilege wholesale from civil to criminal cases. The privilege has a three-part test. First, courts consider whether there's a valid trade secret at all and whether disclosing the information would cause harm. Second, they assess whether the information is relevant and necessary to a case. And third, they weigh the risk of harm from disclosure against the need for the information. If the court rules in favor of the party claiming the privilege, then there's no disclosure at all. So the privilege affords a total non-disclosure withholding remedy. In my view, applying that privilege, applying that test wholesale from civil to criminal proceedings is a big mistake for a number of reasons. First, given the rules and realities of criminal procedure, privileging trade secrets in criminal cases is both particularly harmful and also unnecessary. In civil cases, it's risky to assert the privilege because you have a well-resourced adversary who's likely to challenge whether or not you have a valid trade secret to protect. The privilege context can make that inquiry a little bit more difficult than it is just under straight substantive trade secret law because it's unsettled exactly what definition of a trade secret applies in the privilege context. Should it be the substantive definition of the jurisdiction or might the privilege carry its own definition of what a trade secret is? To defend against the challenge to the validity of your trade secret, you may have to reveal parts or even all of the information to the opposing party, who may in a civil proceeding be a direct business competitor, and who might convince the court that your trade secret's invalid, blowing up all its value, leaving you far worse off than when you started if you'd never asserted the privilege in the first place. Those risks, I submit, are likely to deter borderline or even fraudulent claims to the privilege where no valid trade secret exists. But the safeguards generally aren't there in criminal proceedings because few defendants in criminal cases will have the resources to engage in complex IP litigation. 
So the risk of overclaiming and abuse is necessarily going to be greater. It's also going to be harder for criminal defendants to make the showing to defeat the privilege that the information they're seeking is both relevant and necessary to their case. Because criminal defendants are operating on a lower baseline of access to information through discovery and subpoenas. So for instance, Federal Rule of Civil Procedure 26 provides for discovery of non-privileged information that's relevant to a case, whereas Criminal Rule 16 requires that the government is only obliged to disclose information that's, quote, material to preparing the defense. So the materiality burden imposes a more stringent baseline of access to information for criminal defendants, so it is harder for defendants to make the necessity showing and less likely that they'll be able to defeat the privilege. Therefore, importing the test wholesale from civil to criminal cases is going to impose a more onerous burden on criminal defendants than it does on civil litigants. Recognizing an evidentiary privilege for trade secrets is also more harmful in criminal cases from a procedural justice perspective because it appears to project the message that the government values intellectual property as much or more than it values life and liberty. Remember that the third prong of the privilege test involves the court weighing the risks of harm from disclosure against the need for the information. When civil courts do this balancing, they often order disclosure under a protective order, whereas criminal courts often deny the disclosure. This suggests that courts are either overvaluing trade secrets in criminal cases or overestimating the risk of disclosure in criminal cases. The way the balancing test is supposed to work, courts should be considering a risk of disclosure not to the public, right? This, this isn't about we give you this discovery and you might go and publish it on the internet, but the risk of disclosure to the opposing party or opposing counsel under a protective order. If instead courts are, I think, mistakenly in criminal cases assuming that disclosure to defense attorneys under a protective order is going to be a harm equal to disclosure to the public, they're effectively assuming that defense attorneys are more likely to leak information, less likely to comply with the protective order, and they may be weighing the possible harm from disclosure to the opposing party differently in criminal and civil cases for that reason. But whichever explanation you choose, for this divergence of outcomes, criminal court's behavior sends a signal about how they value particular groups of people. It signals that they value intellectual property holders more than those directly affected by crime and more than other categories of persons who are compelled to provide testimony or documents in cases, including criminal cases, even, so, even when doing so would impose a financial burden. Adding insult to injury, all of these harms are unnecessary because unlike the liberal discovery available in civil proceedings, criminal discovery and subpoena powers, as I mentioned, are relatively constrained. Criminal defendants generally may not discover broad swaths of merely tangentially relevant documents. They have to establish, as I said, some showing of materiality up front. There are more differences too. So Rule 16 permits the government to disclose just summaries of expert reports that it intends to int introduce at trial rather than reveal the actual report or bases for an expert's opinions. Criminal subpoenas have to make showings of relevance, of admissibility and specificity, whereas civil subpoenas uh, are, uh, allow you to subpoena information that is not itself admissible as long as it leads to the discovery of admissible evidence. On top of that, if a defense discovery request is frivolous or abusive or a subpoena is unreasonable or oppressive, courts have the power to deny or quash it for that reason without resort to a privilege. So even without a privilege, defendants are exceedingly unlikely to access irrelevant or immaterial trade secret evidence. And courts have all of the resources that they need to avoid situations like gray mail where defendants might seek improper, uh, seek information for improper purposes. And of course, when trade secret evidence is relevant and material to a case, then as with a slew of other types of sensitive information that's regularly at issue in criminal cases, courts can limit disclosure to attorney's eyes only, to experts who sign non-compete agreements, evidence can be displayed on screens that are visible to the jury but not to the gallery, litigants can be instructed to refer to information using abstract terms, courtrooms can be closed. We already know how to do this 
from civil trade secret misappropriation and criminal trade secret misappropriation cases. There are plenty of strategies to protect trade secret holders without an evidentiary privilege that affords a non-disclosure remedy. The second set of reasons uh, for why I think the theory of trade secret law just doesn't mesh in this criminal context is that compared to substantive trade secret law, an evidentiary privilege actually overprotects intellectual property. As I believe you heard yesterday, trade secret law doesn't grant perfect protection. It gives you rights against misappropriators, not against the world. Trade secret law does not limit proper use or acquisition. Compared to that doctrine, the evidentiary privilege overprotects for multiple reasons. To start, trade secret evidence that's subject to discovery or subpoena already enjoys the standard ex post protections that are available under the substantive law. So if somebody submits an abusive subpoena or they violate a protective order, that would count as misappropriation and the trade secret owner could sue them, they could even face criminal charges, layering a privilege entirely to withhold information on top of those existing remedies necessarily means protection plus. Next, we might think of the privilege as an ex ante injunction. Of course, they both prevent the use of information in advance rather than punishing its abuse after the fact. Even if we think of the privilege as an injunction, it still overprotects. And that's because under the substantive trade secret law, it's hard to get an injunction. <laughs> You generally have to show that the information is vulnerable to actual or threatened misappropriation. You can't just speculate somebody wants to steal it, but you can assert the privilege just by showing that if the trade secret were disclosed, it would harm you more than benefit the opposing party. So you can assert the privilege on pure speculation that the information will be leaked. Perhaps then the best analogy for how courts are treating these trade secret claims in criminal cases is actually to the inevitable disclosure doctrine in trade secret law. This is a doctrine that permits injunctions based on circumstantial evidence rather than direct evidence of actual or threatened misappropriation. It applies in circumstances such as when a departing employee might go to a competitor company and because of the work they'll be doing, they will inevitably rely on trade secrets even if they disavow any intent to do so. Yet even here, the privilege is easier to get and thus protects intellectual property more because first, not every jurisdiction recognizes this doctrine and those that do require at least some showing that the circumstances of a particular case will inevitably lead to misappropriation. In contrast, criminal cases, at least in practice, have upheld this privilege without any showing that particular defense attorneys are especially incapable of complying with a protective order. Finally, as a number of scholars have pointed out, trade secret law is designed in part to facilitate information sharing in important situations like business negotiations and regulatory oversight. So of course you don't need the law to protect your secret if you just don't tell anybody about it. That makes it hard to sell, to hire employees, to submit for regulatory approval. So trade secret law helps you make limited protected disclosures in important situations. Like business negotiations and regulatory oversight, criminal proceedings should also count as important scenarios for controlled disclosure. For all these reasons, courts are approaching trade secret claims in criminal cases the wrong way. They should refuse to extend this privilege wholesale from civil to criminal cases. Legislatures should pass new laws that limit safeguards for trade secrets in criminal cases to protective orders and nothing more. So to give, that hopefully gives an overview of just some relationship at an abstract level between trade secret law and the criminal context in which these claims appear. Uh, but one of the situations procedurally where we're seeing trade secret systems entering a criminal cases is at bail. I wanted to alert you all to SB 10 in California it was passed last summer, which um, starting in next October is gonna eliminate the use of money bail in California and require the use of pretrial risk assessment instruments in making pretrial release and detention determinations. 
One of the most common risk assessment instruments uh, that is likely to be used, although I don't believe the law by text requires that one, is the Arnold Foundation's public safety assessment tool. Compared to Compass, the Arnold Foundation has been far more transparent. They have released the uh, formula for the risk assessment instrument. They've released information about the data that they use to train the risk assessment instrument. Um, but they have not disclosed uh, other information, why they chose to use the data that they chose, um, whether they performed certain validation studies, if they did, what those outcomes were. Um, Robert Brownies and Ellen Goodman did a fabulous article where they sent these open records requests to courts and tried to obtain information about the Arnold Foundation tool. And they were told by the Arnold Foundation that one of its reasons for an earlier, more confidentiality stance before they had released the information about the formula is that they wanted um, to limit new jurisdictions' implementation of the PSA while they undertook uh, uh, studies and uh, to what they said, guard against the possibility of for-profit companies using elements of the PSA to develop substandard risk tools to be marketed to jurisdictions. Since they gave that explanation, they have not only incre increased their stand of transparency, but they have also started to release their tool for free uh, to any jurisdiction that wants to use it along with uh, training material that they've put up on their website. So I wanted to just share that uh, explanation of a trade secret claim that was meant to use uh, for quality control. Thank you. And now we'll hear from Dana Delger, who will take us to the next step of the process. Thank you. Uh, being a lawyer without a PowerPoint, it sort of feels like, I feel like Philippe Petit, especially as, you know, as the weekend has gone on, seeing like the thread that I'm walking on be taken away by others. But uh, I'll do my best to not be overly repetitive. Um, so my work at the Innocence Project, at least in this context, is mostly focused on probabilistic genotyping, which we've heard a lot about. So I'm going to try not to be repetitive, but talk to you a little bit about the sort of practice angle and some of the things we see as it actually operates in the real world. Um, I'm going to start by talking a little bit about the context in which these systems have arisen. I think that's important for understanding what's happening now, even in the trade secret context. I want to talk through actually some of the things that Rebecca touched on, some of the practical, um, the backdrop against which these cases are getting litigated. And I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, California v. Dominguez, which is a very recent StarMix case that was just decided in California's intermediate courts. So we actually had a question yesterday, I think it was by Glenn, about whether you know, whether the relevant question for some of these algorithms isn't, you know, are they bad or good, but are they better than what we had before? And I do think it's worth noting in the probabilistic genotyping context that what came before PG systems was, I think, fair to say, bad. Um, as DNA sensitivity and our, in some ways, our knowledge about DNA and our techniques have grown exponentially in the last five to 10 years, uh, our ability to pick up really small pieces of DNA has just bal ballooned, and we can really know much more about, find much more DNA than we could in the past. Uh, the flip side of that is as you pick more and more DNA up, you find more and more mixtures. And so things that we wouldn't have seen as a mixture some time ago are now mixtures. Uh, we're seeing tons of low-level DNA, and our ability to meaningfully interpret that DNA has not caught up with our ability to find it. And what we have seen is that prior to PG systems, what most labs used was a technique called CPI, the Combined Probability of Inclusion. Um, and as it has turned out, that is not a scientifically valid and reliable way of determining who is in a mixture. And we have seen extreme malfunctions of the system in CPI cases. Uh, we're seeing this most, most in Texas, not because Texas is particularly bad, but because Texas is the only state that's doing anything about it. But we have seen in recalculations of CPI cases, people going from extremely high levels of inclusion to inconclusives. That should frighten us. That should frighten us in a world where people are testifying about DNA when we say we, we are, someone is very likely in this mixture because it's very unlikely a random person would also be included. And they're not actually, they're either not in there, or even if they are, as a sort of ground truth matter, that the science doesn't support it. Um, 
Just a few weeks ago, NIST released a big study that has been in the water for a long time, and 65% of labs falsely included contributors to a particular mixture. And of the labs that failed to include, only seven actually said he wasn't in there. That's terrifying. If you're a person who's uh, facing criminal charges, the loss of your life or your liberty, and a DNA scientist is saying, you're in this mixture and you're not, that's a problem. So to that extent, and you'll have to excuse me if I'm a little out of breath, it's like running a marathon talking these days. Um, you know, to that extent, the development of PG systems has a lot of promise, and you can understand why the system has been sort of grateful for their arrival. However, the problems with CPI should give us pause. We should be, we have to learn from what we have, should learn from CPI example, which is that we actually have to know if the system is working. We actually have to have a, the system, the scientific systems we use have to be valid and reliable to be used in court. Uh, and it takes a lot in the context of probabilistic genotyping to really understand whether that's happening. But as you've heard throughout the last two days, that's very hard for criminal defendants to do. And I think to some extent, we've heard, you know, to some extent I think the trade secret assertion is really actually to some extent just acting as a foil for other pressures in the criminal justice system. Um, so I want to talk about those a little bit because I think that's sort of the backdrop against which this drama about trade secrets is being played. Uh, yesterday someone said, when the, you know, when the 14th Amendment goes up against the trade secret privilege, we all know what wins. And as the speaker was saying, the 14th Amendment, my colleague from Legal Aid Society and I were both like under our breath saying, trade secrets, obviously. Because as it turns out, it's extremely hard for defendants to win on constitutional challenges. Uh, there's sort of an old saw in criminal defense, you know, if you're raising the Constitution as a criminal defendant, you're probably in trouble. It means you don't have a better claim to raise that the court can actually rule on. Um, and it's very hard, particularly in this kind of context, where the sort of right that you're trying to locate is hard to find. Now, don't misunderstand me. I think doctrinally it's very clear. You do have a, you do have a due process right to this information as well as other rights at which we could locate. It's really, really hard to get courts to say that. And actually, we always quote this in our pleadings, so I'm gonna say it here because I really like it, because uh, it illustrates some of the problems, which is in a case called Crane v. Kentucky, the Supreme Court says, whether rooted directly in the due process clause of the 14th Amendment or in the compulsory clause, compulsory process clause, or in the confrontation clauses of the Sixth Amendment, the Constitution guarantees criminal defendants a meaningful opportunity to present a complete defense. It's beautiful language, but it suggests the real problem, which is even the Supreme Court is like, we don't know where the hell this comes from. We just sort of think you should be able to get it somehow. You are in trouble if you were going to a court and saying, well, it's one of these rights somewhere in the Bill of Rights it gives me access to this information. This is particularly true when, as Rebecca pointed out, criminal discovery is extremely limited in some states more than others. In New York State, for example, we have some of the worst discovery laws in the entire country. Um, one time I wish I had a slide so you could see, we have a statute which enumerates what you're able to actually obtain in discovery through the state, and it would not surprise you to learn that source code is not enumerated on that list. That's what you get. Uh, other states have better discovery laws, but even then, most discovery, as Rebecca hinted at, is conditioned on possession by the state. And so we have a regime in which to the extent you're able to get sort of court-mandated discovery or sort of your discovery as of right, it comes from what is in the possession of the prosecution. So Tate Secret does a little bit of extra work for the prosecution by letting the state outsource some of its traditional responsibilities to private actors. Not only does that give the state, um, not only does that give the state the promise of a technology like True Allele or StarMix, but it gives the state the ability to no longer hold in its possession information it might otherwise have. Um, and that's a really, really significant when you see this outsourcing of what would traditionally be done by the state for the state by someone else. Our discovery rules traditionally are very bad at dealing with that kind of question. We sort of have two regimes for discovery. We have the discovery you're able to get from the prosecution and police and state actors, and your discovery that you can get through third party subpoena. There's a lot of information that is relevant to criminal defense that's over here in this bucket that third parties have, right? Defense attorneys, prosecutors, we want information from Facebook or the phone company. That can be hard to get, and I'm not saying it doesn't have significant consequences for criminal justice, but Facebook and the phone company produce services that are incidentally produce information that's helpful or harmful to a state's case. Companies like Starmix and True Allele, ShotSpotter, Stingray, these companies produce information 
expressly for the purpose of introduction to criminal proceedings. And somehow our law doesn't really have a way of dealing with this third category of information. Private actors who, whose entire existence is predicated on introduction into criminal court. And yet, so we're sort of barred from getting it on the left by the ordinary discovery rules, even without trade secrets. You're barred from getting it on the right because the trade secret assertion gets put forward. And so you're stuck, despite the fact that this is information that isn't just incidental. It didn't just happen to be created. It's created for this particular purpose. I should, we'll talk about Dominguez in a minute, but one of the things that came up in Dominguez uh, that got asserted by the state, and I think by ESRO as well, was that seeking the source code to StarMix was like seeking the source code to Excel. If you don't understand the difference on many levels, but at a minimum, the difference between Excel, which a prosecutor might use, and StarMix, which a prosecutor uses in a totally different way, which is designed for the prosecutor's use to create criminal evidence, it's a totally asinine analogy, but it got a little play with the court. Another, and I'm probably overly cynical about this because I do most of my work at the project around pattern and impression techniques, particularly things like bite marks, which are for those of you that don't know, and it came up briefly yesterday, extraordinarily bad science that are still admissible in all 50 states. Um, so I, my, my beliefs about this are influenced by that work. But I have to say part of what else happens with the failures of courts to really grapple with the trade secret privilege is that no one really cares whether forensic evidence works or not. And that's probably a cynical thing to say, but it's true. If you look at the way forensic evidence has been treated in our courts, uh, the our court system is extremely bad at dealing with forensic evidence, with scientific reliability, and courts just frankly don't care. And when you're in a world where something like bite marks, which has no scientific reliability whatsoever, has been repeatedly disproven, led to dozens and dozens of wrongful convictions, is still admissible everywhere, it's pretty easy to see why a court doesn't really care about something like StarMix or True Allele, which in fairness to those programs, have a lot more to, at least in theory, back them up than many, frankly, virtually all the forensic techniques other than DNA that are routinely admitted. Um, this may be following up a little bit on Kathy, the sort of lemons. Like, you can sell lemons in the criminal justice system pretty easily. Partly that's because there's very little feedback, right? We have wrongful convictions, but they're very few. Or what provable wrongful convictions are relatively few. So it's hard for people to know whether something is actually working or not, because you can just put it in, you get a conviction, you put it in, you get a conviction, and there's very little feedback about whether did this technique actually operate in the way it should. Now, partly that's for reasons that aren't really malicious. Most forensic techniques don't actually identify a suspect by the time a forensic technique is done, even including in most DNA cases, the police had some reason to suspect a person, so they brought you know, they brought someone who has a prior out of guilt, if you're a Bayesian, to the police, you know, to the, to the forensic scientist who then says, does his analysis, and he's more likely to be right in that case than he is, even if the technique is totally unreliable, than he would be with a random person. But so I think that really plays out in this context as well. The courts are not that interested in looking under the hood because they're not that interested in looking under the hood for any forensic technique that we use. I also want to touch on the showing question. I think that's really important. In an explicit way, this has turned, this has affected many of the cases that we see in this context where courts have said, have denied access, and this is part of what happened in Dominguez, is that you haven't made a showing of why you need this. And you can hopefully see how circular that is. I mean, the defendant is trying to get the material, he's being asked to make the showing about the very thing he's trying to get the thing to make the showing for. He can't actually say the code, you know, this has been miscoded. It's not operating the way it's supposed to in my case. There's something undisclosed. He can't say that without the code. So he's being asked to prove the thing he needs the evidence to prove before he gets it. And it's almost impossible to do that. Uh, what we've seen, you know, what lawyers have tried to do and what we try to do, you know, the Innocence Project, the Legal Aid Society, the ACLU, EFF, have tried to assist defendants with amicus briefing, support, trying to lay out reasons why sort of in the abstract people should have access to this information. But nobody can say, including experts when, when attorneys get experts to write affidavits, can say that in this case what I'm going to find is X. That's why you're trying to get it, to see if there's something there. And in fact, in other contexts, although I should, since my call, um, in other contexts other than with some exceptions like police disciplinary records, we don't actually ask defendants to make a showing about 
what they're to prove that they're going to get something out of a particular cross-examination question before they ask it, before a line of argument before they make it. It's very backwards to ask people to do that. Um, I think related to this point, and it actually comes up in the showing context as well in terms of the kinds of materials people can get and very relevant in a conversation about competition in the probabilistic genotyping context is how few experts there are. And that is a very, uh, extremely real problem. There are probably less than 20 and probably really less than 12 people in this country today who could testify about star mix and true allele tomorrow as experts. And of those people, almost all of them have competing programs, right? That, that is just a fact. And so we are down to, I mean, as a practical matter, the people who actually testify about this on behalf of defendants are two people. That's a problem. That's a problem when these techniques are being used in thousands and thousands of cases. What we've seen in the non-disclosure agreements and likely also in protective orders to the extent we ever get this information through protective order is going to be an exclusion of competitors. That may work in a context in which there are lots and lots of people you could ask. That's really hard in a context where there's very few people you can call upon and those people often have their own programs. And why, I mean, that's the person in theory you as a defendant want to ask. If I had star mix in my case, I would want to ask Mark Perlin, the developer of True Allele, to tell me what was wrong with it. And he'd be happy to do that, <laughs> very happy. Um, but defendants have had a very hard time and it, and it only gets harder as, and I'll talk about the non-disclosure agreements in a second, it only gets harder as every time an expert is used, in particular the one expert who testifies the most, every time he signs a non-disclosure agreement, you know, he, it's very easy for those agreements to close him out of practice, to put him out of work, because he can't use anything he's learned from the last time he was able to look at the code, notably under extraordinarily restrictive conditions that are probably not that amenable to actually producing real results. Um, he may not be able to testify again, and he can't use that knowledge. So everything I've just said, I think, played out to some extent in the case I'm gonna talk about briefly, uh, Dominguez, California versus Dominguez. <laughs> Mr. Dominguez is a very interesting case. Uh, this is actually his third trial. He was, uh, went to trial, uh, there was a mistrial, nine to three in, ver in uh, favor of acquittal. He went to trial again and was convicted, and within days of his conviction, it came out that the lab had changed the way, the lab had acknowledged the problems with the CPI it had done in his case. And that actually before the lab analysts had testified, they had changed their procedures and nobody told the defense. And the, the statistic in his case went from an extremely strong inclusion on bloody gloves found at the scene to being inconclusive. And under the lab's new CPI policy, they could no longer testify he was on the gloves. Was in, a, in a world in which you have nine to three in favor of acquittal, and suddenly you've taken out the piece of DNA evidence that your blood, you know, your blood is on the gloves found at the crime scene, that's really significant. And even the prosecution had to acknowledge that, and so he got a new trial. So what does the prosecution do? It doesn't roll over. It says, okay, if we can't get this DNA evidence through CPI, we're gonna go to Starmix. And so they went to Starmix. Starmix has run the results. And lo and behold, Starmix says he's in this mixture. So the defense attorney did a few interesting things. And the way that the case actually got litigated put the trade secret issue a little bit in the back seat. So he litigated the case primarily on the notion that Starmix was part of the prosecution team. And so he, under California's rules, would be entitled to get the source code, the user manuals, and other materials from, directly from the prosecution. Now, we also did a third-party subpoena, but what ended up happening for Mr. Dominguez was that the judge actually agreed. The judge said, you know, Starmix is actually doing the prosecution's work here, and you should be able to get this information directly from Starmix. The judge was really concerned, so we heard a little bit that Starmix actually does give, will give over its source code. However, it only gives it over under non-disclosure agreements that are so restrictive as to possibly, you know, it, they're almost unethical to sign and I think probably actually are for attorneys. Um, it, the agreements actually prohibit, literally on, on their face, prohibit uh, essentially critique of Starmix in court without Starmix's written permission, uh, among other things. And they permit the expert to examine the source code, you know, with a paper and pencil, uh, with somebody from Starmix there, just looking at the screen, you know, sort of a few hours. Um, I'm not a computer scientist, but even I could suggest that that's probably not the way in which we would want like a robust evaluation of the code. Um, the lawyer, you know, refused to sign it, and the judge agreed that it was a real problem. And part of that is that, you know, a non-disclosure agreement versus a protective order, and there are issues with protective orders as well. 
is negotiated entirely, I mean, in this case, entirely by StarMix. It's a contract of adhesion. There's no like discussion about what should be in it. But StarMix doesn't have the defendant's constitutional rights in mind. In theory, the judge does. In theory, the judge, when he writes a protective order, has to balance everyone's interests, primarily the defendant's interest in his liberty and his constitutional rights, which is not an obligation StarMix has. I've got two minutes, so I'll try to speed it up. Um, not surprisingly, with a defense win like this, the state appealed. And the issue on the appeal was this notion, number one, was Starmix part of the prosecution team? And number two, shouldn't Starmix get to have a voice? So part of what happened was that Starmix wasn't in court. The way this was litigated, they, they ultimately came and intervened into the appellate litigation. But really, it was the prosecutor in court telling the judge, not only do I not have this information, but if I did, it's a trade secret. So the prosecutor is sort of asserting the trade secret on behalf of Starmix, who's not there. The appellate court was very concerned about this, and in a, but found a sort of interesting way. So it was a loss for Mr. Dominguez. We're back in the trial court. Uh, but the trial court did not, the appellate court didn't say this is in fact a trade secret. Uh, and in fact, I think there's some, some reason to think they won't, at least as to things like the user manuals, which are, fun fact, widely distributed to labs across the country, so perhaps not a trade secret in the ordinary terms, even if the source code could be. Um, but that that we would go back to the trial court, Mr. Dominguez would have an opportunity that, you know, it didn't come, they're not part of the prosecution team, but then Mr. Dominguez would have an opportunity to make the showing that he wasn't able to make before, query whether he'll be able to make it just on remand because it's hard to make these showings, but they'll be able to make a showing of necessity, that they'll be able to talk about that and that ESR will have a voice, the maker of Stormix will have a voice and whether or not the materials will be disclosed. It remains to be seen the, what, what the trial court will be able to do with the non-disclosure agreement as opposed to a protective order. The appellate court didn't really turn on that question whether a non-disclosure agreement is, an appropriate, is even appropriate at all in a criminal proceeding as opposed to a protective order. Uh, even in civil proceedings, it's my understanding that it's protective orders rather than non-disclosure agreements that are governing what happens. But that's Dominguez, and I think hopefully you know, we, all, we have the pleadings if anyone's interesting, interested. Hopefully people are interesting here. Um, <laughs> to see the sort of development of how, how these trade secrets really get litigated in practice. It's a very sort of pocket universe case that covers a lot of the major issues. Thank you. All right, and our last speaker, we have to turn on the overhead. I'm not sure I have the technical expertise to do. There we go, magic. It's Crystal Logan who will finish with the well, last thing. So yeah, I'm going to be talking about sentencing and trade secrets as proprietary claims in the post-conviction process. And we've already heard a little bit about that from um, Jason Schultz yesterday and from Natalie Rahm yesterday, but I'm hopefully going to add some insights to what's already been said. I'm going to get a little nuts and boltsy about this stuff just so you can get some actual concrete examples of what goes on in the sentencing context with algorithms and the trade secret claims that go on in these kinds of cases. So trade secret claims are most likely to be made and those states have moved in the direction of adopting evidence-based sentencing um, and evidence-based parole decision making. And what that involves essentially is use of these instruments called risk assessment instruments or RAIs. And these are statistically derived algorithms that are meant to help judges and parole boards figure out who is likely to recidivate. And supposedly these actual devices are more accurate than clinical judgment, the traditional seat of the pants judgments that judges make based on dangerousness. And in fact, research tends to show that they are more accurate. So here's an example of an RAI. It's called the Violence Risk Assessment, excuse me, Appraisal Guide. It's used widely in Canada. It's used in a number of American jurisdictions as well. As you can see, it relies on 12 different risk factors. So for instance, it looks at a person's psychopathic tendencies. It looks at other diagnostic conditions. It looks at age at the time of the triggering offense, some various factors having to do with family, familial status, some factors having to do with antisocial conduct, uh, history of alcohol abuse, and some factors having to do with victims. So the evaluator using the VRAG combines all these points and then puts a person in one of nine probability bins. So for instance, if a person gets a score of zero to six on the VRAG, that's associated with a 35% chance of recidivating. If a person gets a score of 21 to 27, they're in big trouble, that's associated with a 75% chance of recidivating. 
Here's an example of another REI. This was actually developed in Virginia. Virginia has been very aggressive, very enthusiastic in developing these risk assessment instruments, and it has quite a few of them. This is the one to be used if a person is being convicted of fraud. Now, the top of it's cut off, but you can see the most relevant parts. As you can see, in contrast to the VRAG, this relies on five risk factors, offender age at time of the offense, gender, prior adult felony convictions, prior adult incarcerations, and whether the person was on parole or probation at the time of the offense. Then you add up all the points here, and if a person gets 32 points or more, then the recommendation is for some kind of prison time. If, on the other hand, you manage to slip in under 32 points, the recommendation is for some alternative to prison. Okay? So I showed you these two because these, were, these two risk assessment instruments were developed by publicly funded, by government funded programs. So I can show you the precise risk factors being used and I can show you the precise weights uh, that are assigned to those risk factors. But unfortunately, at least from the defendant's perspective, a lot of RIIs are not so transparent, especially those developed by private companies. What the private companies do is they make trade secret claims so that the information underlying the, the codes and even the risk factors used in these RIAs are uh, protected by trade secret law. And of course, the most famous of these, given what you've heard the last day and a half, is Compass. You've heard about this instrument several times now. And as you can see, what the Compass does is it evaluates risk in five different domains, criminal involvement, relationships and lifestyle, personality and attitudes, family and social exclusion, and then it puts all that together and comes up with conclusions about the three things you see at the top in red, violence recidivism risk, general recidivism risk, and pretrial release risk. And usually the risk is framed in terms of whether the person's high, medium, or low risk. But you don't know the precise risk factors being used, and you certainly don't know the code underlying how the risk factors are combined. Well, um, and so what is the compass being used for? Well, Natalie mentioned this case yesterday. Uh, the compass figured very prominently in connection with this particular case. Uh, Loomis was sentenced to six years in prison, based in large part on the outcome of an evaluation using the compass, which concluded that he posed a high risk. So Loomis argued that, that his sentence was a violation of due process. Why? Because he was not given information sufficient to figure out how his risk score was computed. The Wisconsin Supreme Court, though, rejected that claim, said due process was not violated for essentially two reasons. One is one that Natalie mentioned yesterday, uh, which was that Loomis was given the answer to 21 of the items on the compass, and therefore he, is an, he and his defense attorney could double check the information that was used to come up with his risk score. And so as the Wisconsin Supreme Court said, um, the trial court avoided relying on information. The defendant did not have an opportunity to refute, supplement, or explain. But of course, Loomis came back with the argument, that, well, okay, yeah, so now I know what the risk factors are and the information used to assess those risk factors, but I still don't know how they were combined. I need to know the algorithm, how were these risk factors combined so I can figure out the accuracy of this instrument. To that, the Wisconsin Supreme Court said, hey, we already know about the predictive validity of the compass. It's been tested in several different jurisdictions, and the court cited studies in California New York, which essentially said that the compass has adequate predictive validity. So basically what the Wisconsin Supreme Court said is if the defendant is given uh, the risk factors and the information the state used to decide whether or not those risk factors existed in his or her case, and if it's shown that the RAI, RAI has sufficient predictive validity, then the defendant's not entitled to the code, to the algorithm, to the weights the risk factors are given, and therefore the, the court upheld uh, the claim that the compass is protect, protected by trade secret law. By the way, the company that developed compass was mentioned yesterday and initially was called North Point. It's now called Equivant. So if you go online, look up Equivant, don't look up North Point. Okay, so um, I have problems with both of these conclusions by the Wisconsin Supreme Court. On the first one, um, it's not even clear in the, in the Loomis case that Loomis did get all of the information about the risk factors that were considered and the way in which the, the evaluator uh, ended up computing his risk score, because even though he was given the answers to 21 of the items on the compass, if you look here, you can see there are over 100 items on the compass. So it's hard to believe that his risk score was based solely on the 21 items he was told about. There's probably additional information being used that he had no clue about. And again, that's because of the trade secret protection. I think more importantly, is the second reason the Wisconsin Supreme Court gave, and that is that the compass already has adequate predictive validity, so we don't need, the defense doesn't need to know 
uh, the algorithm, the code underlying uh, the compass. Uh, what you see here is something called a receiver operating characteristic curve. Okay? Uh, the ROC curve was developed actually uh, in the medical context to figure out the accuracy of very, various kinds of medical procedures, but it's become very popular as a way of evaluating the accuracy of risk assessment instruments as well. And the way you calculate the curve is you plot the true positive rate, which is the rate at which a prediction of recidivism turns out to be true, against the false positive rate, which is the rate at which a prediction of recidivism turns out to be wrong. And after you do that plot, you get the curve. And then you calculate the area under the curve. So you can see here the area under the curve for the VRAG, which is that first risk assessment instrument that I mentioned, is 78%. This does not mean the VRAG is accurate 78% of the time. What it means is that there's a 78% chance that a person who recidivate, recidivates receives a higher score in the VRAG than a person who did not recidivate. That's all it means. So in other words, it's, 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 it's a device for figuring out how good an instrument is at distinguishing between high risk and low risk offenders. That's the way these accuracy, the accuracy of these instruments is assessed, and arguably it's not a very good way of assessing it. If I were defense trained, I want to know the false positive rate. How often is a prediction of violence right or wrong? But that's not what the courts are getting. Okay, so one reason for asking for the code is to do a double check on exactly how this mousetrap works. And of course, this has been mentioned over and over again at this conference. It's very useful to know the code so the accuracy can be double checked, so maybe we can tweak it to make it a better instrument. Um, so the VRAG, as I said, has uh, an AUC value of, of 0.78. This is the AUC value for the compass. Well, right off the bat, you can say, well, how come the compass isn't as good as the VRAG? Maybe we should look very closely at the code of the compass and see if we can make it better. Or maybe we should go to the VRAG, or at least import parts of the VRAG into the compass, and so on and so forth. Now, it's been mentioned that the F Defense Bar doesn't really have necessarily the expertise or the resources to do this kind of thing. But I guess the main point to emphasize is if we don't get the code, we can't even start to do this kind of thing. This would be analysis of, of the various RIIs. So that's one point that I think has already been made uh, quite a bit. But I have a couple other points to make about why it's useful to know about the code with respect to these risk assessment instruments. Um, and one of the reasons is, is going to be explained in an article that I, I'm about to publish with Megan Stevenson. Uh, what we did, uh, or what I should say is what Megan did, is reverse engineered the compass uh, using publicly available data in the state of Florida uh, in a jurisdiction that uses the compass. Um, and again, the reverse engineering was very difficult to do precisely because of Ickelvan's trade secret claim, uh, but we managed to do at least uh, a partial reverse engineering uh, job, and again, Megan deserves all the glory for this. And what we found was very interesting. Um, that what we found was that about 55 to 60 percent of the predictive value of the compass is explained by one factor, age. So the, the individual and marginal explanatory power of youth is much stronger than even the explanatory power of criminal history. So that's pretty steady. Now there could be some flaws in our reverse engineering, so keep that in mind, but that's at least what we found uh, as a provisional matter. So if that's true, consider how that might be useful to a judge um, doing some kind of sentencing assessment. First of all, as all of you know, youth is usually considered a mitigating circumstance, not an aggravating circumstance, right? And here are all the Supreme Court cases that say that youth is typically seen as a mitigating circumstance. And yet the compass treats youth, if you believe our reverse engineering, as an aggravating circumstance. And I think at the least, the judge needs to know that fact, he needs to know about this double-edged sword phenomena and know, needs to know how heavily youth influences the risk assessment score so that at least the judge can balance the mitigating impact of youth when it comes to culpability against the aggravating impact of youth when it comes to risk. Okay? But I think some judges would go even further than that. Once they find out how influential youth is uh, it, with respect to the compass and some of these other instruments, the judge might decide, I'm not going to use this RAI at all. Now, whether they would do that, it's not clear. We've heard a lot about how judges just like to go with the flow and not, just not overturn the apple cart. But at least as a judge, it would make you think twice uh, about using the compass if youth really is that heavily influential. Because some judges might decide, you know what? You should only be used as a mitigator. It should never be used as a risk factor. And in fact, there's some Supreme Court case law that, can, that basically takes this tack when it comes to mental disorder. In the Zant case, the Supreme Court suggested that at least in death penalty cases, mental illness should never be considered as a risk factor, may only be considered as a mitigator. And in Atkins versus Virginia, 
the court held that intellectual disability, people with intellectual disability should be exempted from the death penalty, in part because the court was concerned that otherwise capital sentencing juries would use a person's intellectual disability against them because of its association with dangerousness. So if you buy that analysis, you could say, well, we shouldn't use these RAs at all if youth um, is being such a, is such a heavily influential factor because it's supposed to be a mitigator, not an aggravator. And by the way, a lot of these risk assessment instruments also use mental disorder as a risk factor. So that runs directly afoul of both Zant and Atkins, at least if mental disorder is a strong risk factor, which we don't know because of trade secret claims, okay? Um, but it gets even worse, at least if you're a defense attorney. Look at this language from Buck versus Davis, uh, which is a Supreme Court case that came down just last year. It would be patently unconstitutional for a state to argue that a defendant is liable to be a future danger because of his race. That would be a disturbing departure from the basic premise of our criminal justice system. Our law punishes people for what they do, not who they are. So the first thing, obviously, to get from this language is if an RIA uses race as a risk factor, it's in huge trouble. That's not permissible. But as Jason Schultz mentioned yesterday, there can also be risk factors that are proxies for race, but we don't know unless we have the code, unless we can see just how powerful various risk factors are. And in fact, some factors are proxies for race in a very powerful way. Maybe that would also call the RAI into question. But let's leave race aside completely and go back to youth. Look at the italicized language there. Our law punishes people for what they do, not who they are. Now go back to youth. If we enhance a person's sentence in part because of youth, couldn't it be argued that we're punishing a person for what they are and not what they've done? And couldn't that be a huge problem philosophically, if not in actual fact, uh, with respect to these RAIs? So I think there's a lot to say about this. I'm not going to say anything more about it. All I want to do is point out that there's some good reasons for not only getting the risk factors, but getting information about the weight accorded to those risk factors so that we can do this kind of fairness analysis. Um, so now we get to the hard part, which all of us have been struggling with the last day and a half. What do we do about this? Should the law require that not only the risk factors, but the weights accorded to the risk factors be revealed to the defense um, and the judge? And by the way, it's just as important to reveal it to the judge as it is to the defense attorney, right? Um, and like Andrew Yoth and like Natalie, I think the most potent constitutional provision is the Sixth Amendment's confrontation and compulsory process guarantees, which, by the way, apply to sentencing as well as trial. Sentencing is seen as part of the criminal prosecution referred to in the Sixth Amendment. And there is some Supreme, Supreme Court case law that bolsters this position um, of a right to get information that forms the basis for a sentence. In Gardner versus Florida, the Supreme Court held that the defense is entitled to discover the contents of a pre-sentence report so that the reliability of the contents can be examined by the defense, okay? Now, the government made a whole bunch of arguments as to why this rule was a bad one. It said, for instance, that this discovery might make uh, people reluctant to talk to probation officers about uh, what's relevant to the sentence because they might be worried the defendant will find out and somehow will come back to haunt them. There might be other reasons why sources might be reluctant to talk to a probation officer if they know this discovery is possible. Uh, the government also argued, hey, if we give this information to the defense, you know what they're going to do. They're going to muck things up. Defense attorneys all, always do that when they get information. That's going to delay the process. Uh, it might disrupt the rehabilitation process because there might be some psychologically traumatizing information in the report. And then when all is said and done, the prosecution said, look, judges have been doing sentencing for years. They can separate the wheat from the chaff. They can figure out what's reliable, what's not reliable in the pre-sentence report. Well, the court wanted nothing to do with any of these objections. The court said, no, there has to be discovery. And it based it on the due process clause. As Dana said, the court sort of back and forth on precisely what constitutional provision should be the basis for these kinds of decisions. But I think the language you see here resonates very strongly with the confrontation clause. This is what the court said. Our belief that debate between adversaries is often essential to the truth-seeking function of trials requires us also to recognize the importance of giving counsel an opportunity to comment on facts which may influence the sentencing decision. So I think this is what defense attorneys need to rely on. It needs to be elaborated on. Of course, those of you who teach criminal law know I've left that one important part of this sentence. The last part of it says in capital cases, okay? And you all know the court's much more concerned about reliability in capital cases than in non-capital cases. My only response to that is, I mean, think about Loomis. I mean, it hardly makes sense. It hardly seems right to tell Loomis, who's likely spending a couple of extra years in prison because of a flawed RII assessment, to say, oh, we only care about reliability and confrontation in, when the death penalty is on the table, and not when just a few years are being added to your sentence. And I think that position 
um, can be bolstered by the court's decision in Roviere versus United States, which was not a capital case. It was a simple drug case, a non-capital case. And what the court held here, as defendants are entitled to, to learn the identity of confidential informants, if that informant has access to information that can be relevant and material to the defendant's case at trial. Okay? Now, look at the year of Roviero. I mean, this is the Warren Court. Who cares what the Warren Court said, right? But, uh, so it's a long time ago, it's a Warren Court opinion, and it is true that cases since Roviero have construed it very narrowly, but they still, they haven't done away with Roviero. It still is the case that the defendant can show the informant's information is crucial or very, very important to the defendant's case, then the identity of the confidential informant should be revealed. Um, so even though we're talking about confidential informants here as opposed to confidential algorithms, I think Roviero is a very strong precedent for revealing uh, the risk factors and the code underlying uh, risk assessment instruments because to me, given the reasons I've said, these are crucial factors that the defense is entitled to have. So as a result of all that, I think defendants should win and prosecution should lose. Thank you. <laughs> And on. <laughs> uh, I think we'll follow the same practice, and, and I'll, I'll set the microphone for folks to queue up as they wish. Um, I'm also going to take the prerogative of, of moderation to ask uh, the first question. But before I do that, I thought, um, you know, uh, just to sort of frame what I've been hearing this morning, it feels like there's kind of three general ideas that are driving concerns about transparency in this space. And it, it's uh, likely true also in the civil space, but I think it becomes more um, you know, sharpened in the criminal space. So it seems one set of concerns are accuracy driven. Um, one set of concerns might be loosely called procedural justice. Uh, you know, even if um, these are accurate results, there's just something kind of unsound in the way that we treat people. Uh, to give sort of non-transparent decisions, even if they're the right decisions. Um, and then the last I would call just sort of a rights-based claim, right? That we have a, a set of rights out there in the Constitution for defendants, and you know, you have a right to a jury, whether you are stone cold guilty uh, of the offense, and it's obvious, or you have a right to a lawyer, no matter what the evidence looks like in a case. And so it's not really about accuracy, it's not about any kind of notion of dignity or procedural justice, it's just, you know, this is a very Scalia idea, right? We wrote the right down, and so you get it, whether it's, you know, a good one or not. Um, do you have a sense of which of those per should predominate in this analysis, or is there another one I'm not thinking of? I mean, is it really a third, a third, a third? How, how would you think through these issues? I'll throw it well, to anyone. Uh, I'll, I'll take a, a stab at it. I, mean, I think that's an interesting typology of reasons to worry about all this stuff. And I'm going to, just for fun, take the opposite point of view of the one I just espoused. Okay? <laughs> Love uh, it, again, right. just for fun. Because I don't hate risk assessment instruments, despite what might have, uh, might have, it might have sounded like just now. Um, <laughs> and I think it's because of what Glenn asked yesterday, compared to what? Um, if you think about what judges used to do at sentencing, and still do, at sentencing, in terms of figuring out how long a sentence should be, at least in indeterminate sentencing regimes, where risk can be a consideration, it was a total crapshoot. I mean, you had no idea what judges were relying on. Someone mentioned earlier today one of the problems with algorithms, at least if there's a trade secret allegation, is that you're not getting an explanation. Well, you never got an explanation from judges as to sentence. You might get a sentence or two from the bench, but you didn't get a real explanation. And even if the judge gave an explanation, I would wager the judges often didn't really know why they were giving a person a sentence. As we all know, there are lots of unconscious motivations for various kinds of decisions. At least, as was mentioned yesterday, algorithms specify the factors you're looking at. They're right there on the paper, at least with the VRAG and the Virginia instrument. They're right there on paper. You can see supposedly exactly what's being relied upon when a risk assessment is being made. And we do have AUC values. And we actually even have false positive rates um, which can be compared to seat of the pants clinical judgment and study after study after study shows that actual prediction is better than clinical prediction. So on your first prong, accuracy, even though I just argued that we need to know the code in order to evaluate accuracy, um, I think there's something to be said for risk assessment instruments. In terms of procedural justice, same kind of thing, arguably. You know what the risk factors are, you know precisely what's being relied upon, and if at least you give the defendant the information that's being used to decide whether the risk factor exists, the defendant can challenge that information. You know, if you're saying I have five felonies, well, I only have three felonies. 
And one of those was dismissed, so you can't give me the score associated with five felonies. There's actually more procedural justice involved there, maybe more accuracy involved there, but certainly more, you get more of a sense that there's voice being accorded the defendant arguably in that situation. Um, I'll leave the last one alone, the formalism kind of <laughs> argument, uh, because it's about Scalia and I don't, I don't want to get near that. Okay. <clears throat> um, but I think those are all things that are at issue here I, and all extremely important. I do, I, I guess I push back a little bit on the notion that I'm sort of, of course I agree that the, the constitutional rights are extant and important and critically, you know, critical to be observed regardless of the ultimate accuracy. But those two things go together. And part of why we're in such a sorry state where we are in forensics generally, in criminal justice, I think, is that we haven't had the sort of robust, certainly evidentiary gatekeeping, but even constitutional, you know, constitutional challenge to the forensic sciences that would help us answer accuracy. I mean, what you see in the confrontation cases for example, before Melendez Diaz and Bullcoming, is we just assume it's accurate, we let it in. I mean, how could a breathalyzer be wrong? Mm -hmm. I mean, lots of ways, they're wrong all the time. <laughs> New Jersey notwithstanding. Yeah. <laughs> uh, actually, just last week, the New Jersey has to is going to be dismissing 21,000 exactly. more DUI convictions because apparently one guy in the state of New Jersey calibrates all the machines and calibrated them all wrong. Um, <laughs> how that is possible, it sort of boggles the mind. Uh, but, you know, we. We have to have, I mean, the, the rights-based question help us answer the accuracy question. That said, it's not the only thing that has to answer it. And part of what you know, we've discussed with Gina and others is that you know, de relying on individual defense attorneys in individual cases to be the sort of, like every time figuring out whether something is working or not. Of course, defense attorneys have to do that in every case, in part because, especially in the probabilistic genotyping context, whether something works in the abstract is very different than whether it worked in your case. But we don't even have sort of a general gatekeep. We don't, you know, we don't have the National Commission on Forensic Science anymore. Courts have roundly ignored things like PCAST and the National Academy of Sciences. So we don't even have sort of like a national, we don't have a good way of saying at the outset is something generally good or acceptable? Is it accurate enough for our use? So we really put a lot on the individual defense attorneys in individual cases to answer questions that are huge, important, and complicated, and difficult to resolve in the context of a single proceeding, which may only be asking part of the questions that would be relevant to society as a whole or to other defendants facing the evidence. I like the taxonomy of accuracy, procedural justice, and rights. I just would love to add something else to it, if I could, which is, you know, maybe this may be motivated for me by the limitations on the rights-based approach. And you had asked us to talk a little bit about different stages of a proceeding. And one of the difficulties, for instance, with bail is, you know, what what are your rights at that stage? Or if you're talking about mm -hmm. parole, what are your rights at that stage that you can assert to try to get access? And so maybe because of that, and maybe because of my um, uh, I feel like original training in the FOIA context, partly from Jonathan Manis. Uh, I'm particularly interested in what are the justifications for withholding. Mm -hmm. So there's a, there's a fourth category, which is why would we treat intellectual property differently than we treat other kinds of evidence? Uh, is, 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 is it appropriate to give intellectual property better treatment than other property interests? Forget even going beyond property, but other financial burdens that individuals have to uh, experience when they comply with subpoenas. You raise a really important point that I think is worth noting in this context, which is that you know part of the reason we talk a lot about probabilistic genotyping is it's it is a place in which the the trade secret in which the protected algorithm is actually introduced as evidence at trial, which means that there's actually a mechanism by which the defense can challenge it. Many of the things that we talk about and see, predictive policing, uh, to some extent shot spotter, lots of the tools that we see never make it actually in an explicit way into the criminal trial, which makes it extremely difficult for defense attorneys to challenge it. If they even know it's being used, half the time they don't. But even, I regularly consult with attorneys in which we know, we know facial recognition was used in their case. We know the stingray was used. We know, we, we know from various sources that a particular technique, protected by trade secret or other sorts of proprietary you know, protections, were used in their case, but there's just literally no way for us to challenge its use because the prosecution is not going to introduce it as direct, as direct evidence of trial. Now, that technique may totally have poisoned the course of the criminal proceeding or really shaped what happened, but there's no hearing for something that's not going to be introduced. There's no way, and it's not to your benefit to bring that out in front of the jury just so you can try to discredit it. So you really can end up in a bind where things are being used in ways that 
we might be concerned about in civil society, but none of these, you know, all of these things, accuracy, procedural justice, and your rights-based approach, pre presume there's some forum in which you can raise your claim, and in many, in many cases there isn't. Mm -hmm. Do we have a question? I'm going to ask another question. If I, you, have. I, I, you have a question? Yeah. <laughs> um, which is, is this? Um, I'll try to frame it. So uh, in thinking about this taxonomy, I, I have another thought, something about this, which is something I've been thinking about, and I'm curious to know what you guys think, all of you, is, so it seems to me that one other potential problem with the introduction of something like a risk assessment score in particular, is that um, in what sense is it actually evidence in the way we normally think about evidence? So let me explain what I mean. So we expect that um, a judge or, or in a jury, if, it, if we're in a, the trial setting, um, listens to all these different facts and then kind of weights them and thinks about how they fit together. And the issue that I, one of the issues that I see is really problematic with some of these cases where you don't know what is in there and where it came from and whatever is, I have this risk assessment. Suppose I have other evidence. How do I even know how to, th in what sense is this a fact that I can think about how it plays with the other information? So if, if the, take the extreme case where I don't even know what factors were, ta were taken mm -hmm. into account. Now I have some evidence about, I don't know, something. I don't even know, was this in there or not if I'm, if I'm the judge? So I think there's a kind of, to me it seems like there's a kind of evidentiary, what is evidence and how does it work question that's underlying some of this stuff. So I'm just curious what you guys think about that. <coughs> I'll say something. Yeah, okay. Go for it. Um, um, I think that's an interesting question. I mean, um, at least even with the compass, you get a little bit of information, right? But I was talking to Larry Krasner, some of you may know, he's this progressive prosecutor just elected in Philadelphia, and he says they use risk assessment instruments there, and the judge gets nothing other than that label high, medium, or low risk, and the judge doesn't ask for any more information. And apparently the defense attorneys don't push it either. Um, so how is that evidence? I guess is one way to ask that question. Um, and I think it isn't. I don't think a judge should be allowed to rely on such a conclusive kind of statement. Um, even if we get the risk factors, I think more needs to be given to the defense attorney and the judge. One of the interesting things, and this, again, it's going to sound like I'm arguing in favor of <laughs> risk assessment instance, but one of the interesting things about it, if you remember the VRAG where you put in a probability bin, which sounds really dehumanizing and clockwork orangey and so on, but at least it forced the judge to, to come up with a decision about the threshold yeah. at which it's going to be necessary to confine someone or, or intervene in someone's life. Whereas if you're just getting high, medium, or low, you have no idea what that means. It's just whatever compass the, the, the equivalent thinks high, medium, and low means. Um, with the probability level, you are forced to make a, an assessment about, about probabilities that will lead to confinement. Um, so I think there's a problem with calling it there's some of this stuff evidence, but I think if you provide the risk factors, the information relevant to the risk factors, and the codes, I would be willing to consider that evidence and in a way that might actually improve the criminal justice system. <clears throat> um, so a long-winded, I'll try not to be too long-winded about way to answer that question, or, or not answer it, but there's a real concern that you've raised there. So in forensics, we're seeing a shift in part because of probabilistic genotyping to um, uh, presentation of evidence through likelihood ratios and Bayes' theorem, and if you don't know, Bayes' theorem is a way of thinking about information, and what it presupposes is you've got this idea, prior out of guilt. You know, you, the judge, have some idea this person is you know, guilty or that he's got a certain likelihood of recidivism. Then you get some new piece of information, say the risk assessment in the form of a likelihood ratio, and you multiply that by your prior out of guilt, and suddenly you have this new, you know, you have a new out of guilt, and then you get the next fact and you multiply it. Obviously, no one on earth even statisticians that I like to deny it, thinks this way. Like, no one lives their life formally thinking through Bayes' theorem and updating, continually updating their odds. However, the one thing that Bayes' theorem is sort of useful in this context, I think, in thinking about in terms of trade secrecy and risk assessments is that it makes very explicit that every, every piece of evidence has to sort of be on its own in the likelihood ratio, otherwise you end up with double counting. In the sort of traditional forensic context, we see this with cognitive bias, right? If my bite mark expert knows the defendant has confessed, and then he says, and we literally had bite mark analysts tell me, well, if I know there's DNA, then I'll say it's definitely him. 
right? When he does that, he's counting that evidence twice and the jury hears it twice. The jury hears that he's confessed or that there's DNA and the bite mark analyst says there's a match. In risk assessments, you have this problem too where you know, if the judge is already, he's looking at the person who's young, you know, he's looking at his criminal history, mm -hmm. he's looking that he's young, he's maybe had taken in all these facts in another way, and then he's seeing the risk assessment as some independent piece of evidence that he then, you know, adds into his thinking, even though he's already maybe accounted for those other factors, many of the factors, and we don't know which ones or how, in his thinking already, like, right, the person, the judge has some idea what he's going to can't help it, he has some feeling, right? So you end up with double counting, and double counting that you can't quantify or that you don't even know. The judge may not even realize, you know, when he says, boy, he's really young, and the risk assessment is really strong. Like, he may not know that actually that's already being mm -hmm. counted for. So that's a real concern. I can't help but add on that I, you know, I think also in the case law, just to get really technical, you know, when you look at the confrontation cases in forensics, Melendez Diaz and Bullcoming and then up until Williams, there's a strain of justices that think about evidence from machines as just like a totally different thing. You know, this is machine evidence. It's a, it's a neutral. <laughs> Um, and, you know, I because I agree generally with the idea that in forensics we have a long storied history of just looking away, so it's hard to locate this particular moment without knowing that this is just like looking away from bite marks and looking away from all the other problematic sciences, but there does seem to be a different flavor of it where there, there's a real belief that this is, um, you know, just a, com a complete neutral, and I, I think that's an important hurdle that any litigant will have to overcome and it goes back to being able to access information that counteracts the assumption of the neutral but then having to prove that it's out there in order to even make the claim in the first place and the last thing i'll say is even within evidence law itself uh you know it, when you think about say hearsay exceptions there's a concept within certain exceptions like the business record exception that um, documents produced sort of with an eye toward litigation the kind of palmer v hoffman idea are problematic and we don't quite have that same relationship with yeah. this third category I think Dana talked about with, you know, this is an entire body of evidence um, created for the purpose of, you know, convicting people essentially or for criminal justice purposes. But we haven't yet conceptualized that as inherently suspect the way we do other forms of evidence. Um, this has been really fascinating and thank you. Um, I was really sparked by seeing the um, chart about um, the reverse engineered um, yeah version of Compass here. And I, I it, it sparks a question from a few different um, directions here, especially given your answer to Kathy um, just now. So I guess, you know, one, one way to ask this is, um, let's say I take the age up there, right? Um, how confident are you that the different factors there are those factors rather than things that correlate with those factors? And I'm going to ask that from another angle is, um, what will transparency <laughs> do in this context, to the extent things correlate with other things, um, you may have a very different looking system that does the same thing. Um, so for example, age might correlate with um, number of years of schooling. We may feel less troubled. Or employment status. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and we may feel less troubled mm -hmm. by um, that being an aggravating factor than age, which we might feel very differently about. And I, I find one of the things that really intrigues me here is that these correlating factors, um, when we list them, we might just react very differently then to them, even if they're doing the same, giving you the spitting out the same high, medium, low um, risk assessment. And so I'm wondering how to wrap my head around that, yeah, it, how it, to it, think about that. You were asking a very good question. I think it's a very difficult question. I think, again, one of these things these risk assessments do is make us think very hard about the purposes of punishment and what can be the basis, for, a legitimate basis for a sentence. So one way to respond to what you just said is age could never be a risk factor because it has nothing to do with conduct, much less blameworthy conduct. Criminal history can always be considered because it has to do with blameworthy conduct. And then in between, you've got marital status and employment status, which is conduct but not blameworthy. And maybe uh, it's okay to rely on that because it is conduct. Maybe it's not okay because it has nothing to do with blameworthiness. Um, another possible outcome of this kind of analysis, and I could go on for a long time about this, but is we just can't do risk assessment because it, it relies on, other than criminal history, it relies on factors, inevitably, whether it's done seat of the pants wise or with an algorithm, that we just don't feel comfortable allowing punishment to be based on. I mean, people like Andrew von Hirsch have been arguing this for years, that we just cannot do risk assessment, make risk assessment or dangerousness a basis for a sentence because of the kinds of things you're raising. Um, so this is a huge issue. Um, I happen 
to think that it's okay to do risk assessment for various reasons I won't go into now, but then you still have to do the hard thinking, okay, if we can do risk assessment, what kinds of factors can we rely on? And of course, even criminal history is suspect, right? If you're worried about proxies for race, well, drug offenses. It's a great proxy for race in a lot of ways. And it's for that reason, some of the predictive police, like PredPol supposedly, mm -hmm. that we heard from Jonathan, described by Jonathan this morning, no longer uses drug offenses as part of its algorithm because it is concerned about the fact that those are produced by biased policing. So they're just huge, difficult issues uh, entangled in your question, which I've answered in a sort of a haphazard way, but uh, I think it's a very interesting question. <clears throat> I mean, certainly the major, I mean, from the defense community, the major critique of risk assessments is that it just repackages unpalatable and unacceptable things like race and class in, in terms that are more palatable. And we're, you know, what we're really doing is asking, is this defendant poor and black? And we're packaging that in terms of, you know, in terms of things that are, are tolerable. And certainly even things like criminal history have, are hugely problematic to, to assign particular I mean, everything we know about the way our system of policing and prosecution and conviction works is that it operates in extraordinarily racist and classist ways, and you know, purposefully so. And so, it's very hard then to say, you know, somebody in New York City who has had five arrests, you know, I can almost guarantee you that person doesn't look like me, and that doesn't necessarily mean that person is more blameworthy than me, but that that person is black or Hispanic or lives in a neighborhood that is heavily policed, AKA a black or Hispanic neighborhood. So it's really a hard, a hard issue. I just want to give one more example that illustrates the conundrum your question is raising. There's another risk assessment tool called the Oxford Risk of Recidivism Tool. And actually it's very highly touted. There's a lot of good psychometric properties to it. It's got lower false positive rates than a lot of these instruments. But one of the very interesting, I'll use that phrase euphemistically, one of the very interesting risk factors is something called the neighborhood deprivation score. And what you look at are the number of welfare recipients, the number of unemployed people, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and that is a fairly influential risk factor in this instrument. Well, that not only has nothing to do with blameworthy conduct, it has nothing to do with the defendant's conduct at all, other than maybe the fact they live in this neighborhood, but otherwise it has to do with other people's conduct. So again, you raise the issue, is that the kind of thing that can be considered in relation to what Dana was just saying? <clears throat> Could relate to like political policy in that, you know, how much yeah. they've got good housing policy. <laughs> that's right. Well, uh, that's actually one of the things these risk assessment instruments do also suggest what society needs to do in yeah. order to eliminate or reduce crime. <clears throat> Question? Yeah, it is on. Um, so uh, I, I'm not a lawyer, I'm an ILI fellow here, and I've been a software vendor. So these might be two rather naive questions. The first is um, it seems like a lot of the problems are coming from. Uh, judges that seem to like not really know what they're doing or are <laughs> abdicating their responsibilities in some sense. Gotcha. What's going on with the process of training these judges that like makes them so bad at using this technology? And two, if there's a problem with the software, what happens if you just ask the software vendor to change it? Like the changes you're proposing are like trivial engineering things, right? So mm -hmm. if you could just change it and say, well, what if you took this factor out or, you know, like, Vendors sometimes like have customer service, and they do that. So, are there, is there any interaction like that going on in the space? I can answer the first question a little bit. I mean, fantastic point. It, the reality is that judges in the criminal context have totally abdicated their right. gatekeeping responsibilities, just utterly. Um, Peter Newfeld did a study a few years ago that looked at the rate of Daubert. Uh, Daubert is the federal and many state standard for the admission of scientific evidence. Uh, looked at the rate of Daubert's successes in criminal versus civil proceedings, and he found that in civil proceedings in which you sort of, maybe like a toxic tort, tort litigation, Daubert challenges are almost won, almost always won. So big money plaintiffs almost always win their challenges keeping out novel scientific evidence, and they almost never win in criminal proceedings. I mean, judges just do not under, they don't understand science, they don't really have to. We live in a, you know, in addition to some of the things, you know, one of the things I failed to say earlier, although I think we, we heard it from Kathy, is that the role of precedent plays a huge, you know, huge role in keeping judges from examining new scientific evidence because they don't have to. They can just say some other judge, some other time thought this was good. Now we do a lot of work at the Innocence Project, you know, the Legal Aid Society does as well. We all do our best to educate judges, but at the end of the day, it's like, throwing tears into the sea. I mean, you really are asking judges to do something that they don't want to do. 
and don't really have to do and have a lot of easy outs from doing. And actually, trade secrets is sort of one of them. They don't really have to dig it in there. I, I just want to emphasize that. I mean, to me, sentencing is the most important part of the criminal justice because that's where the rubber hits the road. That determines how long a person spends in prison. And the judges, I think, have totally to use that word, and you used it too, abdicate the responsibility here. I mean, it seems to me there ought to be a jurisprudence of risk assessment, and there isn't. There is a huge literature on culpability. I mean, if you go to any law school library, you're going to find volumes written on what criminal responsibility means. There's virtually nothing written on risk assessment, the law that governs risk assessment, and the judges aren't interested in developing it, partly because Defense attorneys aren't challenging them on it, partly because defense attorneys don't have the information they need to challenge judges on it. Um, so that's one answer to your question. Um, when I train judges, which I do quite frequently, they don't like hearing about this stuff. You all know the difference <laughs> between Fry and Daubert, right? And you, you just mentioned it. Judges hate Daubert because Daubert taken seriously means they have to understand scientific thinking. They have to understand error rates. They have to understand statistical significance, at least at a basic level. Fry, all they have to do is turn to the expert and say, do you guys rely on this or not? <laughs> and if the expert says yes, it's generally accepted, and they're off to the races. Um, so when I go to the National Judicial College, there's a lot of hostility expressed toward Daubert and a lot of fondness expressed toward Fry because they just don't want to deal okay. with this kind of stuff. Well, we've got to train judges differently, which is what I try to do when I train judges, to be at least a little bit more scientifically conscious. And on your second point, there's not much interaction for all the reasons we're just suggesting, but there are some developments in this regard. For instance, Pennsylvania is developing some risk assessment instruments, um, not the ones that Larry Krasner mentioned, but uh, that is bringing in a panel of experts from different walks of life to help develop algorithms that avoid the most obviously unfair or unconstitutionally suspect, uh, constitutionally suspect factors. You're still going to have proxies, but nonetheless, there's real attention being paid to the kinds of issues we're talking about. But were you actually <clears throat> suggesting that software developers who sell to criminal justice customers should be required to make modifications requested by individual defendants? And then revalidate. That just seems like good business practice. You know, if you have customers that are happy but we're not the customers. Uh, okay. Yeah. Crime labs, prosecutors, police. But I mean, I think that's a fascinating idea. But in fairness, like the PGS systems, they, you know, Perlin went out of his way after being attacked a few times in court about your, you know, your consumer is prosecutors, you want to please your consumer, that means returning inculpatory findings. He deliberately started this like little pro bono defense <laughs> side. So now when he's qualified as an expert, he says, oh, I also do work for the defense. I've led to, you know, I've done tons of exonerations and blah, blah, blah. And so there is like, there's some neutrals in there. Like they're not all just, you know, it's, it's a little more complicated oh, of a story. That's sort of a real, I mean, I, I said this a little bit yesterday. I mean, I think Starmix and Trulio are a very unique part of our criminal justice system yeah. because of these personal relationships. And Mark Perlin would do anything to get at John Buckleton. And if you called <laughs> Mark Perlin tomorrow and said, like, I've got a Starmix result, like, can you, like, help me? Like, I want to take down Starmix. Like, he'd be ready. And so that's a little, I, I, I think you're, you are right to the extent that there is some response. I mean, I do think that these developers are listen, listening. They, you know, that if there's stuff out in the water, there's some critique that's going to be offered against them in court. They may have some interest in, in fixing it. I do think, though, it's worth noting, at least in the context of probabilistic genotyping, that there's like a second layer of opacity you know, beyond trade secrecy, which is that this is extraordinarily high-level math that almost no one on Earth understands. I mean, Mark Perlin, I've been teasing him a little bit. I mean, he has two PhDs, and he's a medical doctor. He's got a PhD in math, a computer science, and he's a medical doctorate. John Buckleton is equally credentialed. You know, the average person, average defense attorney, even the average expert is not capable of breaking down Markov chain Monte Carlo and breaking down the math to really understand is this working or not. It takes a lot. So it's not trivial to say in the context of probabilistic genotyping, oh, I've, you know, found this, this issue, why don't you fix it? I mean, we can kind of complain at the edges as defense attorneys about what we see happening with our results, but it's pretty hard for us to say, oh, actually, like, you've calculated this wrong. I mean, I don't have a PhD in math and almost no one does. Could see, at least in the shot spotter context, that modifications could help establish a feasibility argument. So if you, for instance, were able to insert something that allowed ShotSpotter to filter out human voices the way audio source separation could do for music tracks, maybe that would allow defendants to then present 
an alternative technology to the court and say, look, they could have done this differently. I, I could see that developers being responsive to criminal defendants' modification requests might be a fantastic idea. Yeah. Uh, I want to intervene with a political theory intervention for a moment, <laughs> and this is returning to kind of a distinction that Aaron drew at the beginning that I'm kind of curious about how people are biting or not biting on this. So when I step back and try to figure out what gets you all so angry, right, uh, one possibility is just purely procedural injustice, that the results that it gets are the exact same results that the judges would have gotten. So I show you the patterns of distribution, but because the system by which we reach this is one that we think is procedurally unjust, I am bothered by that. Doesn't so much sound like that's what's getting you angry, right? Second possibility is it's about the pattern of distribution of results, that uh, even if I thought that this was kind of a perfectly good way of getting this outcomes making decisions, when I look at who benefits and who uh, you know, suffers from the distribution, I'm bothered by the distribution that occurs. And try and kind of understand this and test this, I thought a little bit about the following hypothetical. What about if, if it turns out that the same groups you are worried about are being you know, burdened by this, actually, instead of allocating uh, aggravation, we're allocating mitigation. So it turns out that all of your favorite groups, because of the use of the AI system, get more mitigation, but in ways that are based on factors that kind of bother you. I mean, this is not a zero-sum game. We can give out more mitigation. So the end result of adopting these systems you detest is that actually fewer people of color, fewer people who are whatever your preferred groups are, end up with less time in jail. Would you still be here kind of railing against it? And can we imagine an opposite group of you people who are made up of <laughs> former AUSAs, Jeff Sessions, and tough from crime people who would? So trying to be provocative. I mean, it's a little strange to hear people of color described as like our preferred group of people, sort of like that, like we go around looking for disadvantaged people to sort of champion. I mean, it's part of what you're saying isn't that hypothetical. I mean, we have actually seen that risk assessments, there is some evidence to suggest they reduce the number of people being held in jail without bail. I mean, there just is some empirical evidence that that's true. Uh, that doesn't necessarily change. I mean, there's a whole other set of problems with what happens when we don't give, when, there's a whole other set of problems we haven't even touched on and are sort of out of the scope of this about what happens when someone's, you know, held in like in new or released in a state in which they have risk assessments and then are put into all sorts of programs and just a whole other set there it doesn't mean it's appropriate it it just may mean that we're there's still a problem with repackaging our old you know we heard about this yesterday repackaging our old biases our old problems in a new form that's almost impossible to challenge i, I think that problem exists regardless of whether regardless of the outcome and i think there's probably you know the reality is that Despite this empirical evidence, which almost everyone acknowledges, you know, many of the sort of groups you might expect, civil liberties groups, groups that represent defendants, have there are grave concerns about the use of these instruments. Doesn't mean they shouldn't be used necessarily, but that we have to be we have to be careful with them. Well, here I am sort of making our argument for these instruments again. Um, <laughs> Uh, Rebecca mentioned the California statute. What is it, SB 10? Is that what it's called? That's, yeah, now it's the California money bail. Yeah, so, so, so to get rid of money bail, which yeah. I think most civil libertarians should be applauding because the money bail system is incredibly discriminatory and a very bad system. But what to replace it with is an algorithm, and ACLU has come out against that too. Well, this, I think, demonstrates your issue in a very concrete way, in a very topical way. Um, and I actually was a little bothered by the ACU's position. It seemed to be almost an unthinking knee-jerk reaction against algorithms for all the reasons we're talking about, even though I think it is better than money bail. Now, certainly the algorithm could be made better, but it's relatively transparent. Um, and I think we need to think about that kind of thing when we're debating these, these kinds of issues. There's a lot more to be said about that, but I, I'm glad you asked the question. <clears throat> I'm just gonna say I'm agnostic about the technologies. <laughs> what worries me is that technologists interests are changing the process of law. And I think it's a democracy issue. So technologists are the ones that are concerned about their trade secrets. Trade secrets didn't used to be protected in criminal proceedings. Now they're protected in criminal proceedings. That changes whether we have an adversarial process or effectively an inquisitorial process where only outside experts get to look at stuff. And it's a shift without any debate without any discussion from adversarialism to expert inquisitorialism that I'm most concerned about. 
Hi, yeah, so I, I, this discussion actually, um, it's, I, it, it makes me think, uh, it makes me wonder whether there's an important difference between the use of these risk assessments at sentencing as opposed to with, with respect to bail determinations. Because it seems like with respect to bail determinations, the standard is, is the person going to, um, uh, is there, are they a flight risk or um, are they going to commit another crime while they're um, out on, on bail? And it seems like the, the risk assessment tools are meant to measure that, more or less. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Uh, but w when it comes to sentencing, if, if you're measuring just those things but factoring into sentencing, it seems like you're privileging just one of the considerations of sentencing, which is incapacitation, right? You're right. not thinking about deterrence. You're not thinking right. about whether it's just punishment. You're not, um, you're not thinking about the rest of the factors. So I wonder if part of the concern here is that because one of these things can be measured, <laughs> Um, we can measure the likelihood of a person committing a crime again. We can't really measure just punishment necessarily with an right. that. Maybe we could, I don't know. But um, that what, 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 what we're doing is we're just prioritizing this one thing that's supposed to be considered at, at sentencing, um, and that's part of the problem. It's a mismatch. It's sort of the technology is um, changing the nature of the legal decision because suddenly one of these factors is more visible. Um, and related to that, I wonder if there's been any empirical work to see whether the use of these risk assessments at sentencing has lengthened or shortened sentences. Yeah, so that, that's a, ver a very good question. I mean, one of the reasons, first of all, I think risk assessments are, ought to always be challenged. Let me make that very clear. So I agree with everything Rebecca said. It has to be transparent. We need to have confrontation of the risk factors and the weights given to them. But assuming that, one of the arguments for risk assessment, and one reason I'm sort of on the fence about this, or maybe even on, on the pro side of the fence to some extent, is I think it's a mechanism for reducing incarceration, which is absolutely egregious in this country. Um, what, the way Virginia uses these instruments, um, what the, the legislature said in Virginia is we want a risk assessment instrument which will allow us to reduce our nonviolent prison population by 35%. That was the mandate from the Virginia legislature, and they did that using risk assessment instruments. Why? Because risk assessment instruments make it very clear that most people are not high risk. They're just not high risk, uh, no matter what algorithm you use. I'm not using high risk the way Compass uses high risk, okay, not in a conclusive. I'm talking about the probability of recidivism is relatively low for most people, at least recidivating in terms of violent crime or something very serious. So these risk assessments make that relatively clear and therefore maybe help reduce incarceration. Now, you're right that it's a quantification of um, something that, uh, it's quantification of an issue. Um, having to do with incapacitation, we can't quantify culpability responsibility in the same way, so it might over-prioritize risk. I think that's a very good point. Um, so what, you need a jurisprudence of risk. When can you make risk assessments? I would argue you need to have a sentence range based on culpability, whatever the hell that means, and then risk determines the sentence within that range. <clears throat> just, just to follow up, you, you could imagine actually quantifying um, whether rehabilitation would work, right? But I don't, I don't know of any systems that quantify, if we put this person in diversion. Actually, there problem. are some. I mean, a lot of these oh, risk sorry. assessment instruments include not only static factors, but dynamic, fa but dynamic factors that are factors that are changeable by the individual. And now there's now a whole movement called risk needs responsivity, which tries to identify factors that would be very useful in terms of rehabilitation. And it would be nice if we moved more in that direction. <clears throat> But again, it's all secret right now. We'll take our last question. Trying to bring it back to the purpose of this conference. <laughs> so I found, oh, wow, that's flat. OK, so I found really interesting the VRAG factors that you put up, because the very first one was a psychopathy checklist, yeah. which, is, which indicates that the algorithm is an algorithm built on other algorithms, mm -hmm. which is then built probably on other algorithms. And then we have this problem about certain factors actually being proxies for other things. And it all seems like it is turtles all the way down. And I wonder. Like, <laughs> at what level of granularity do we need to get this information for it to be useful, or are we always going to be left with, well, there's some other category of data that, right. that we can't get at and that's actually driving at least a part of, of what the risk assessment tools are doing? So I'm sorry, that's really just a question for Chris. Okay, so I guess I'll answer it. I mean, I, uh, um, I, I think it's a very good observation. The psychopathy checklist, that you may have noticed, is weighted seven times more heavily than any other single factor on that instrument. So it's an incredibly important aspect of the violence risk appraisal guide, and it is essentially algorithmic. 
But if you're an aggressive defense attorney, you can find out the questions on the psychopathy checklist. That's not protected by a trade secret, by the way. Uh, that particular instrument's not. And so if, now, on the other hand, it uses things like um, expresses no remorse uh, or has no empathy. Now, how do you deal with that on cross-examination? But nonetheless, that's the kind of thing you can find out. So you can inquire into that. I'm not sure there are any turtles below that, but you're absolutely right. That's at least one turtle that's below <laughs> the algorithm that I showed you. Well, on the other hand, again, you could argue, if you're in favor of these things, well, at least we're finding out what they're relying on. Whereas right now, a judge looks at the guy, and if he's not smiling at the judge, he says, that guy's a psychopath. He's going away for 10 years. <clears throat> yeah, jump in. So, Aaron, you mentioned eyewitness testimony. So the, the way we know that that's bad is because Elizabeth Loftus did all of these studies, <laughs> um, not of the people who are being convicted, but just independent studies. And I wonder if any of that's going on here where there's you know, an attempt to use these risk assessments, for example, just to see whether people out in the world are you know, likely to be violent but not, not criminalized. It seems like we could do independent studies um, as, as a way to try to show judges that, that this is not working very well. I mean, actually, there's quite a bit of research on this. And one of the problems, of course, with studying risk assessment instruments is if a person's considered to be high risk, what happens to him or her? They're put in prison and put in treatment programs, so we can't actually test the validity of the instrument in a way we might like to. At the same time, unlike with a lot of these kinds of things we're talking about, including DNA for that matter, um, we, have, we, can, we can get ground truth if we do release a person, and there have been studies that have done that. There have been situations where people were released yeah, that's uh, out into the public yeah. and uh, after a risk assessment has been made. And so we can, there are several situations where that has happened, maybe because of a legal decision, for instance, yeah. And so we can actually evaluate the false positive rates. And as a, there's a meta study that came out in 2012 of 73 studies that tried to evaluate risk assessment in that way, and it found the false positive rate, unfortunately, is over 50%. So again, that's not, maybe we shouldn't do risk assessment at all. We're wrong so often that we just shouldn't allow it to be a basis for punishment. On the other hand, what the hell do we know about culpability? I mean, it's a total crapshoot how responsible someone is criminally. It's all guesswork. <clears throat> Can I just ask, how do you calculate a false positive rate? I mean, yeah. calculating a false positive rate when you're giving probabilistic determination is really complicated. Yeah. How right. are they, how, how do you decide that you were actually wrong? I mean, somebody could have a very low risk of recidivism right. and recidivate, and that doesn't necessarily mean that they weren't low risk. You know, so, so low risk is not. What risk. social scientists used to do is they very, um, they would say whether a person will recidivate or not. But they, they finally got smart. And they said, no, we're not going to do that anymore because it's too easy to show we're wrong. So instead, we're going to call people high risk, medium risk, or low risk. And that's, it's much harder to test yeah. the validity of a statement that someone's medium risk. What does mm -hmm. that mean? If they recidivate, you're wrong. Or if they don't recidivate, you're wrong. OK? But the studies that I'm talking about try to do a little bit better job of calibrating that. But you're absolutely right. That is a methodological problem. <clears throat> So let me, let me say two, a few wrap-up things here. One, uh, you know, I, 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 don't, I think this is an apocryphal story, but you know that there was an instrument to test, like, um, in, in Chris would know probably best if it is apocryphal, but um, like sociopathy or something. And, but like if you, if you test it among like very successful CEOs, they score mm -hmm. really high. <laughs> and so, Without getting too topical. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> and so you know, there are traits that we think of within a deviant population as deviant, but then within, uh, you know, deviant, within a success population as actually um, positive. And, and, I, and you see that work a lot in um, you know, the interface of science and criminal justice, because for instance, they're doing a lot of neurological or neuroscience with sex offenders, but there's an like endogeneity problem there because they were studying the brains of convicted sex offenders to determine what, you know, and you see this in other, you know, the um, child sex abuse, for instance, for a long time, some of the clinical file findings that were used to prove child sex abuse were done based on children examined as a result of child sex abuse claims. And again, you have the same problem, so I don't want to be too graphic, but some of the things they were finding when they actually finally went and looked at tip, you know, children without any claims, they were findings equivalent in the children with those claims. It's just that they weren't doing essentially controls in the right way. Um, so this is a, a long-standing problem in the criminal justice system that we kind of look to the population we labeled as deviant to figure out what deviance is without doing the control for the non-deviant population. Um, but I want to, you know, especially since we've spent so much time on the risk instruments, it applies a little bit to PGS, but, you know, so if I'm, I guess I'm in threes today, but if we think of the kind of, some of the complaints is that they're secret, obviously, they're standardless, and they're biased. 
you know, this sounds like our criminal justice system, right? Like, I'm glad you, I'm glad you raised the um, informants, and I'm glad you qualified it, mm -hmm. because of course, informants are, and it's an area of notorious secrecy. Observation posts, which was a sort of, you know, how we did drug cases for a long time, notoriously secret. The discovery regimes, notoriously secret. Um, standardless, you know, obviously, you, you alluded to in sentencing and at bail, it used to just be even no, no reason given. You know, defendants remanded to custody, you don't get the 20 page opinion about why or what factors went in. Uh, and then biased, I mean, it just goes without saying our criminal justice system is biased. And so framing, that, framing it that way and asking the question that we were currently asked about, is this tinkering around the edges to fix it or is it a wholesale you know, overhaul? Um, is it clear here that the wholesale overhaul, it has to be the way to go? Is there something beneficial about cordoning off these tools to say the secrecy and the standardlessness and the bias is problematic here? Or should we be thinking about this as a kind of canary in the coal mine for the criminal justice system at large? The latter. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, I, no, I, I, th I think it would be very, well, sort of along the lines of what I've been saying, if we in fact take analysis of risk assessment instruments seriously and we apply cases like Wolviero and so on to them, I think we can work backwards to the rest of the system. There will now be precedent that can be used for the rest of the system. <clears throat> when I say this, I speak only on behalf of myself and not on behalf of the Innocence Project, but we should just burn it all down. <laughs> totally, there's really no fixing it. And to some extent, I think you know a lot of the things I talked about today, you know, not to draw too much on my other work, but what we see in this context in some ways is not different at all from what we've seen historically in criminal justice just across the board. And like, we just see, we do the same problems again and again and again. And in some ways it's even hard to talk about them being problems or being a broken system because in a lot of ways it's operating exactly as the way we want it to operate. You know, we, we, it is a means of social control of, of people, of black people and poor people, particularly, especially poor black people. Like that's what it's designed to do and that's what it does. And you know, there are lots of fancy things we put around it, but that's what happens. And so we just see the same narrative play out again and again, you know, abdication of judicial gatekeeping, uh, introduction of evidence that isn't valid or reliable, uh, keeping defendants from access to information that they need to put, present a defense. I mean, these are old stories that we could just, that we just keep telling. And the fact that we tell them with a computer is really not that different than, you know, when we told them with my, you know, my magnifying glass and microscope, it's the same thing. I just want to interject some differentiation between secrecy in the criminal justice system as a whole and secrecy in these technologies. Because there are so many different reasons why you might want to have secrecy. Intellectual property is just one of them. There's confidentiality, there's privacy, there's security, there's law enforcement methods, there's national <laughs> security secrets. So I think the, the issue of secrecy, at least, we can't just uh, paint as one across the system. It's a great point, and I think now everyone's hungry, so let's get some lunch. Thank you.